for this. Okay. Hi. Hi, Mary. I think now it's not so noisy. So uh, you have to go to go live on custom service and everything should uh, start. And uh, well, I'm seeing that you're also recording. So if something goes wrong, we can upload the video afterward. Sure. Thank you very much for your help. Uh, so Mandek, did you say we're not live, live streaming? Because I get a log, I, I don't want to take time um, messing around too much with the technicalities um, now that we've actually uh, kicked off the session. Um, does anyone else would like to introduce themselves at this point, or perhaps maybe we'll break the ice by introducing the team as we talk through and give you an overview of the project, and then I will invite um, other people who have um, who are going to also share some of their experiences, uh, including Dr. Orlando Nje, um, who's going to talk about his community-based project in a wet market in Nigeria. So I say we'll have those. Um, opportunities to briefly give you an over, uh, um, overview of this particular project. And Hi. Hi, everyone. Hiya. Yeah. Who's that? Uh, go. Okay. I'll, I'll, I will continue anyway, just to give you a bit of a background um, about, so the, just to give you an overall um, idea of the objectives of this particular project. If I can get to the next slide. Uh, these are I say these are our project partners, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, um, for which we're very grateful for the collaboration that's been offered um, from a range of the uni universities, uh, with well, the University uh, of Brunel in the UK, as well as Copper Belt University and the University of Zambia. Um, we also thank for the collaboration of the Department of Resettlement in Zambia um, and the United Nations Development Programme, the Apricot Centre and the Refugee Community Kitchen, both in the UK. So the long-term objectives of the, okay, the projects that we're going to be talking about today to start us to kick off the conversation is this idea of expanding cross-institutional exchanges <clears throat> to develop um, further um, research opportunities in the future. We're also hoping to continue working in partnership with the Department of Resettlement and UNDP and to seek funding for community-focused co-created responses. Um, with the idea that ultimately we're developing a community practice, both online and in person, that continues um, reciprocal exchanges to maximize um, the mutual learning opportunities that arise out of this sort of collaborative work. So where did it begin? So Brunel University launched a new undergraduate program in Global Challenges in September 2018 with its own pathway in planetary health led by Dr. Olwen Martin, who's with us today and runs a separate project that she's also going to talk about here. Um, the project, uh, sorry, the program, um, I need to give this background because it sort of segues into why we ended up um, moving towards the ESCI project. Uh, it's a, a transdisciplinary one and throughout the first year, the first year students that you see in this photo, um, uh, students had the opportunity to focus on the multidimensional challenges of Mayukwa Yukwa um, in the western province in Zambia, which is a refugee and resettlement site that Justin Minyaka is going to talk about a little bit later. Um, and he, because he is the coordinator of that particular resettlement scheme. Um, so it was based on the objectives of, of the UNDP Sustainable Livelihoods Program that uh, is run there. Uh, one thing led to another and I applied for some internal offer funding. So offer funding for those outside the UK is, um, is government funding from the Office for Fair Access and it's aimed at supporting students who are considered to be underrepresented in higher education to access opportunities that they otherwise would not be able to access. So uh, we were successful in gaining that funding and this provided the opportunity for students to sort of make their dreams come true and actually um, go to Mayukwa Yukwa um, to visit, um, to work with um, uh, in training, having a training opportunity um, with agricultural officers and farmers, both at Meheba, uh, another um, resettlement site, and Mayukwa Yukwa. Um, uh, and they also, in this instance, they had the opportunity, was privileged to meet His Royal Highness um, Chief Mumana, um, who was also, um, we were able to talk about our objectives in, in, in coming uh, and gain his blessing um, before we proceeded. Uh, then uh, following that, um, uh, Mr. Justin 
Munyaka here in the center of the photo uh, came, was invited to come and give a research presentation uh, at the university and also to work with our students again. So we were very happy to receive him um, and host him at that particular time. And at the time we were working, well, how can we continue to work together? How can we expand things? So basically these, these two things led the, for the, laid the ground, if you like, for our current project uh, and a successful bid as well as another project research bid led by um, Dr. Owen Martin, who's uh, gonna say speak to that a little bit further down. Um, but this particular bid is focused on student knowledge exchange with participants from the University of Zamba, Zambia and Copperbelt University. So I'm just gonna talk about the aims of the ESCI project before inviting. Um, so yeah, this is part of the funding bid was uh, say the Office for Students and Research England who were wanting to gain um, more information about good practice in terms of what works to assist students in um, achieving more. So the overall objective was to investigate the student derived benefits of immersive international knowledge exchange activities based around community and key stakeholder engagement activities. So what impact do these sorts of experiences have on students self efficacy, their cultural intelligence, their leadership and their professional skills. So it's a kind of it's just, in lots of ways it's a it's it's quite a longitudinal project so we'll be watching carefully as these students graduate and then go on to um, on, on in their careers to see if they can link anything that they've gained um, from their early experiences. So what we're wanting to do for this project is develop a kind of model of practice for immersive international exchanges, which we hope will be translatable in other sorts of contexts. Um, create um, a visualization tool that allows us to disaggregate some of the factor factors contributing to the impact. Um, improve graduate outcomes and progression within organizations, particularly for those underrepresented in higher education. So for instance, Brunel is a London university, more than 60% of its students are considered to be underrepresented in higher education, and they are often under substantial disadvantage in the graduate, um, in, in the graduate student market. Um, and the final out, outcome was, is to enhance relationships with communities and say partner organizations, which we hope will lay the ground for further collaboration and research. So just to talk about the structure of the exchange. So it's going to take place over the next couple of years. Um, they're five week immersive opportunities, uh, first in the UK and then um, with the Zambian students coming to the UK and then returning the UK students returning with the Zambian students to Zambia um, with the idea that in between each of the uh, four iterations, there'll be an opportunity to reflect on practice and improve the model. Um, so in each iteration, 20 students will be involved. So 10 from the UK and 10 from Zambia. However, because of COVID, which put a huge spanner in the works, uh, that um, it means that it's going to be delayed. And even though it's been a difficult decision, we have, um, delayed the in-person component of the exchange until June next year, um, mainly because of uh, the opportunity to gain access to um, vaccines. And that's another whole issue about um, the lack of um, access to vaccines of people, particularly in the global south. Um, so uh, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague uh, Mandek, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the activity that students will be engaged in in the first two weeks of the exchange. Um, we'll have a, a variety of opportunities to experience things. Some, somewhere that it will be, if you like, um, the UK students will have some experience of things and in the reverse uh, there'll be the Zambian students will have um, the, the, the upper hand if you like in terms of knowledge exchange because of their own experience and the subjects that they're using. I should point out and again once um, I introduce our um, collaborators from the two universities they'll be able to say about the emphasis that the, of the programs that their students engage in which are quite different from the global challenge program so again lots of ways to work in cross-disciplinary and transdisciplinary manners mandek i will go to the next slide uh thank you everyone um, hi my name is mandek as mary said um the two weeks in the uk i think before starting off on that it'd be helpful for me to sort of set the scenes of what we do in Brunel. 
Um, the work that I focus on is very much in equipping students with the practical resources, the skills and the knowledge to be critical thinkers, but also utilize their knowledge in a way that they're able to apply it into day to day practice and sort of widen their perspective and their scopes of things that we take often for granted or have oversight on um, sort of oversee. In the these two weeks, as Mary pointed out on the previous slide, there's going to be an emphasis on participating in ethical field training and preparation um, and opportunity to participate in a design hackathon based around homelessness in the London context. For the UK based students, this is a growth of what they've done in their project week and I'll take a moment now to describe that. Um, so project week is very much a sort of manifestation of the importance of applied practice. There's this acknowledgement and deepening of understanding of sort of pervasive challenges that exist locally by creating the opportunity for students to take the time and address it in a meaningful manner, but most importantly, through a transdisciplinary approach. This appreciation that each student is able to bring in particular knowledge and skill sets from the variety of disciplines that they um, engage with into the justice challenge. So this year, uh, both the first and second year students had a challenge in identifying non-digital solutions to addressing barriers to primary care for those living um, without uh, for sheltered accommodation or rough sleepers. And what I have put up for you on the slide here is just screen grabs of two, the two in white are the sort of conversations of our speakers and the two in color, the need for podiatry and defining currents of two different uh, presentations of students. For many of the students, while seeing homeless individuals and the realities and the intricacies uh, or perhaps common to them, the sort of complexity and the barriers associated was very much new to them. And this project week was their opportunity to learn from those actively working to break down the barriers, transferring knowledge and principally widening their understanding of their community. So students were able to use design thinking practice to uh, present their proposed non-digital solutions. And honestly, it was remarkable to witness not just the breadth of solutions, but the depth of understanding. And these opportunities are often rare in higher education and creating these opportunities through this project and through the classroom setting uh, creates an opportunity for to us for students to not just try and learn, but to build on reflections that they've had over the years in their in their own unique classes, but over their lifetime as well. And so as part of the SK project, the challenge of homelessness in particular offers the opportunity to dig deeper and frame this distinct manifestation of the unhoused and challenging the very concept of what we mean by homelessness. In terms of work and visits, there's also the opportunity to visit uh, to work with the Refugee Community Kitchen in Camden, but also visit uh, the Apricot Center uh, for sort of two to three days of learning permaculture practice, but also opportunity to engage in even exposure to the clinical settings. So speakers that we've had from Great Chapel Street, speakers that we've had from the councils in order to expose individuals to these spaces, but also have these genuine opportunities for questions and answers as well. Thank you, Mandek. So as I say, in Claude from that health side, we're sort of looking at the intersection between health and agriculture. So I say at the Permaculture Centre, they had the opportunity to consider um, this in relation to conservation, restorative and regenerative agricultural practices. Um, and then students will then um, go together to, oh, outside the core activities, I was saying they'll have, they will have a chance to also rest. So it sounds a bit full on um, and uh, enjoy uh, other sorts of activities. But I'd now like to um, uh, introduce and, uh, and bring in our, our colleagues from um, the Zambian University. So if I could ask um, Professor Stephen Sayampongani to perhaps um, say a few words about his own experiences and how and his interest in this project. Oh, I think you're on mute though. Thank you. Well, my, my experience and understanding of the project is that it's going to actually open up the career opportunities for students in that it will also enhance their thinking as far as the cultural diversity is concerned. 
I think that's the main that's the main main contribution that the project will give to our students. And also the international exposure will ensure that the students are actually exposed at different levels and therefore their contribution to society will be slightly different from just having one kind of cultural aspect whenever they're doing some trainings. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I don't know, is Imelda, is Imelda here? I don't know if she, she is or not. Because it, it, I wonder if Imelda would like to um, say a few words now, introduce herself and her interests. Is Imelda here? Uh, hi, hi everyone. Hello. Um, yeah, I think the name there is showing Dina Kaingwe. I was having to... <laughs> I was having challenges with my uh, my computer. So I think uh, for me, the project is really offering a lot of uh, opportunities, uh, especially when it comes to knowledge exchange, but also the transdisciplinary uh, approach of research where we have students who are engaged in different programs, fisheries, agroforestry, forestry, but then when they go out in the field, I think they will be able to link that to the reality of livelihoods and food security on the ground. But also, even if we say that there are differences in terms of uh, the environment in the UK and Zambia, but I think in terms of livelihoods, it's about survival. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, when it comes to livelihoods, there'll be a lot of learning opportunities there because my interest really is in livelihoods. And uh, you know, it's almost the same. They might be different in terms of culture, but when it comes to food security, agricultural practices and how people survive in their environment, I think it's really a great learning experience. Yeah, I think that's what I can say. Yeah, thank you very much, Imelda. Um, and can I ask um, Victor, is Victor there from the University of Zambia? If not, if he's not here at the moment, he, he might be having problems connecting. I know we've got another um, someone else who's having a, a few problems connecting as well. Um, and the other um, key component of this is, is working with um, the resettlement coordinator, um, Justin Minyaka, um, who I don't think is on the call either at the moment. I know Moene um, is trying to join, but she's been stopped by a firewall of some sort because um, she's, <laughs> I'm just looking at my phone because she's uh, uh, attempting to join there. Um, although she says the internet's fine. So we might, so, so Moene works at the uh, Department of Resettlement and has been really um, instrumental in assisting us in coordinating the various components of things. Um, and Justin has been um, wonderful at, um, uh, opening up the conversation and inviting us to engage in various ways so he with him we're developing strategies to set up the material circumstances to create co-create activities um, with the students and with community members um, so that we can again um, hopefully generatively pass the baton if you like from from group to group over the course of the two years with the aim that by that stage we will get additional funding to expand uh, and engage in other sorts of project activity. Um, so just to, um, until Justin is able to join us, just to sort of point to the, the five different areas that we're planning to be working in. So um, in the UK, looking at permaculture and design thinking, whereas in Zambia, working again on livelihood development in relation to agriculture, um, and food security, working with elders and communities who Justin tells us has have particular sorts of challenges um, and, you know, often um, on the peripheral because a lot of the attention, I guess, is placed on um, agriculture and in young people and less attention on elders within the community and also um, addressing some of the issues around sustainable products um, for girls and women within the community to ensure that they can stay in school. So I think I'm going to stop there and hand over to Olwen, who's going to talk a little bit about her, um, her project, because they work, if you like, the work that's been undertaken through Lab will also feed into the ESCI project in terms of the sort of prototypes that are being developed. So Olwen, would you like to say a little bit of words 
next and then I'm going to open it up a little bit more. Um, yeah, um, um, welcome everyone. I'll apologise for uh, some of the noise. My laptop is clearly not coping with uh, all the depths of the discussion that have been taking place and you hear the fan going mad in the background. <laughs> so apologies, um, everyone. Um, so in terms of um, Z Lab, um, it very much builds uh, on our first visit uh, with our first cohort of students. And it's about co-designing sustainable livelihood in, um, in the Zambian refugee resettlement of uh, Mayukwa Yukwa. So if you go to the next slide, I think we've said a lot already about um, Mayukwa Yukwa and we'd, um, some of the first cohort of students on our first trip had um, identified some potential solutions. Um, technological engineering solution to some of the um, challenges in mm. terms of uh, securing uh, an income and, and good nutrition, um, maybe by producing fruit and vegetables out of season uh, instead of some of the um, cash crops such as maize, cassava and, and rice, or in addition to that. Um, and also because Mayukwa Yukwa mm. is um, quite isolated uh, by road, there's also issues around the um, storage and transport um, of food. And Jimena and myself were lucky enough to be um, selected mm. to take part um, in a workshop uh, funded by the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, they called Frontiers of Engineering for Development. And the specific theme of that workshop in November 2019 was from feeding uh, people mm. to nourishing people. And there's an opportunity to put together a team um, and, and apply for some seed funding um, after that workshop. So um, it was a perfect opportunity to sort of assemble a team of um, engineers or individuals that had the sort of um, engineering knowledge about some of the solutions that our first cohort of students had um, identified and try to organize a co-design workshop uh, in my youth mm -hmm. class. So we have uh, if I think of food production, we have people from uh, Madagascar, we've got Harry here and uh, Lamek from Malawi that work on rainwater harvesting solutions. We've got um, Sheila uh, Sululeve, who's a um, social entrepreneur uh, who builds um, vertical gardens in Kenya. Uh, and uh, Ping uh, from Swansea University um, that has actually um, already um, led student project um, installing hydroponics in the south of Zambia. And then we have people that were also looking at some of the uh, post-production solutions, such as uh, Julien Lépine from uh, Laval in Quebec, uh, who has some quite innovative solutions in terms of making packaging out of um, local materials. And uh, Tilahun Workney from um, the University of Kuala Zoo, Natal, uh, who's worked on cold storage as well as drying processes. Um, and the, um, the sort of global team uh, was meant to travel in the summer of 2020 to hold this face-to-face -face workshop with some of the local stakeholders, the resettled farmers. Um, I should have mentioned that we have had immense support from um, Justin from UNDP on site, as well as, as Mwene in terms of uh, supporting us um, locally. But obviously we were not able um, to travel in the summer of 2020 because uh, of the COVID crisis. And for a while we worked on the assumption that we would be able to delay and travel in the summer of 2021, when it then became obvious that this was not going to happen um, either. So we've had to try to find um, ways of working and building these kind of connections and understanding each other's stories because um, a lot of the people, um, the engineers that have never been on site wanted to develop some kind of understanding of the situation um, on the ground without traveling there. Um, so we are trying to, uh, to find ways of holding this workshop remotely and our team has grown to some extent. So we are very lucky to, uh, to have the support of Emelda to run some sense-making workshops to get all that tacit um, information and, and stories 
uh, from um, the resettled refugees and other um, local uh, farmers um, to, to sort of inform what is their knowledge um, about farming hubs. They they may have transferred the knowledge from their original country to um, to a Yukwa Yukwa. Um, as well as a PhD candidate, um, Martial from, um, from Laval University, who is on the, the uh, telecommunication tech side, where we're trying to find um, technological solution, a good platform that will work in conditions that are very poor connectivity and intermittent connectivity. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Olin. Um, so, uh, so again, that's just to give a kind of overview of things. And now I'd um, like to invite um, uh, Dr. Aladondoy to talk a little bit about his project. And then hopefully we'll then be able to open it up for anyone else to share their projects and their learnings so that we can, I say, learn from each other um, in order to, and any feedback that you have on our proposed plans or where you think, oh, that looks like it's going to create issues or whatever. We're very, very happy to um, receive that feedback. Uh, think of it, if you like, as a bit of a peer review um, process um, to help inform um, what we're doing. Although I've just, one is just, one I think has just arrived. So it'd be really nice actually just before we do that, if you, if she's not too out of breath um, or perhaps we'll come back to her. One A, are you there? But perhaps we'll come, we'll, we'll come back to Moine to be able to talk a little bit about um, her perspective um, of representing the Department of Resettlement. So have we got um, Ayola? Okay, um, good Aye. afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, I can I have the opportunity to share my slides? I did a brief yes. presentation. Sure, okay. I will um, stop sharing. So, um, okay. I should be able to share now. Okay, so um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm Iola Ladinjoy, I'm an environmental microbiologist. I graduated from the University of Lowry um, with a Bachelor of Science degree in microbiology. So today I'll be sharing my um, experience um, regarding a community-based one health project that I conducted um, shortly after the lockdown was eased in Nigeria um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So, um, sorry. So I would just start from a little bit of background on how this whole project started. So um, just after the pandemic started, um, I saw this opportunity, a one health advocacy and mentorship program um, here in Nigeria. It's a virtual event and um, various um, students and professionals in one health related fields had the opportunity to apply. And I got selected as one of the um, professionals for this one health advocacy and mentorship program. So um, the program, um, we're able to discuss topical one health issues Nigeria is faced with, and also had the opportunities to learn and network with um, other professionals from different backgrounds um, um, one of the key um, outcomes of the program is that fellows had the opportunities to carry out a community-based project in any of the, um, in any of their field of interest. And um, I did mine at um, the Jara Fish Market. And the essence of this was to address, you know, the pandemic that was currently happening at that time. So I recognize that you know the wet markets were hotspots for infectious disease outbreak. And also, um, I saw this WHO statistics um, that states that um, a whole lot of people, 12.6 million global deaths as a result of um, living or working in an unhealthy environment. And I wanted to address this at the Jura market because um, it's, um, it's a metropolis where there are serious challenges with waste um, management and um, environmental health um, problems. 
So um, the project had three goals, which was community sensitization on good environmental with management practices. And we wanted to like um, influence behavioral changes amongst the market residents. So we carried out this market-wide cleanup. And um, we also carried out a survey to understand um, the perception of these market residents about um, environmental health and waste, man waste management practices. So um, the strategies we used for the community sensitization at the market, you know, involved um, communicating these problems we are faced with, that is how um, improper waste, man waste management practices can lead to, um, you know, infectious disease outbreak. And um, we were able to achieve this using indigenous languages. Um, we communicated using um, normal, normal in indigenous languages in um, Nigeria because we wanted to reach out to the market people and want them to understand us um, perfectly um, instead of using um, you know, English language in which they may not be able to um, easily relate with yeah, in the community. And um, we liaised with the market heads in order to gain um, acceptance um, in the market as well. So the other thing we did was um, clean up. Um, and um, this process just involved um, us, you know, sweeping the market and just trying to show the market people that they, 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 can, be, they can be in charge of um, ensuring that their market is clean in order to prevent um, the possible effect of um, improper waste, man waste management practices in markets. And um, we're able to also um, go to the shores of the ocean to um, clean up some debris um, that they had there as well. Then we donated all of these clean-up items that we brought to the market, to the market heads. And um, the last thing we did, um, just like I mentioned earlier, was to understand why they had waste issues, why um, the, 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 the market was not well kept. And um, we realized that um, they had some knowledge about um, the effect of improper waste management such as um, you know, um, recognize that there are, are that there are bad environmental behaviors like dumping um, refuse into um, sea water bodies and also drainage system can cause um, health challenges like um, um, waterborne illnesses. But still, they they were still doing these things, and we just wanted to know why um, they were being involved in these bad um, environmental acts. Um, well, this is from what we observed. I and my team we observed that you know it was um, due to you know um, poor um, enforcement by by the government, and um, also um, they really didn't know that you know this can lead to um, a major disaster in the community if not well kept. Um, then, well, so this um, project. Um, was carried out um, as part of my fellowship program, but I was able to form, you know, my team amongst my friends and some other people that um, read about the project online. And, you know, we were able to form this based on our friendship and understanding. And um, we also wanted to impact our community positively. So we had this motivation to, you know, reach out to common people in the market in order to let them understand the effect of, you know, bad environmental practices and how that can possibly lead to more um, more damage or possible pandemics in the future. Um, so, and um, we, are, we, 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 we are about 15 individuals with different skills, some with different skills and background, and um, some had good photography skills, other people writing skills, and we're able to collaborate effectively together to come up with something meaningful for the project. We didn't just raise awareness at the market. We also carried out um, sensitization um, using social media, you know, letting people also know about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and um, the purpose of adopting such practices in their own communities as well. Uh, so these were some of our achievements. We we're able to like contribute positively to our community. Um, we we're able to exchange ideas because we're from different backgrounds. So we we're able to like collaborate effectively together, learn from each other. And also we're able to um, stimulate um, positive behaviors um, in the market because we went for a follow-up after our project and we tried to see if um, they started adopting some of the things that we 
um, mentioned to them about keeping their waste um, properly and also ensuring that they do not dispose waste into drainage systems and um, um, receiving water bodies. And um, this was another opportunity for us to um, leverage our education to do something uh, in the community as um, boosting our personal and professional development process. And um, we're able to, you know, bond together to, you know, coming together to do something meaningful. This actually started, you know, as, um, as an idea on WhatsApp. I formed the group on WhatsApp and um, we started communicating, planning the project together. And some of us were able to meet at the market where we um, carried out the project physically, while others from different parts of the country, you know, um, just did their own contribution with social media awareness and you know, all that. And um, in the process, we were contributing in our own little way, you know, to a safe and sustainable planet, um, just ensuring that um, we reduce the um, the um, um, waste management practices. We reduce waste management practices in our community in our own little way. And also, um, I believe that you know this process is also part of preventing the next pandemic because um, the the COVID-19 pandemic has been, you know, shown to evolve from a wet market in Wuhan, China. And um, we're able to produce two conference abstracts um, from this project. One, a project abstract and also a research abstract um, that, we, that we presented at the 2021 Planetary Health Annual Meeting. One would be, um, one is scheduled to, um, for presentation today. Uh, so, well, that's um, coming to the end of my presentation. And I, I strongly believe that, you know, Africa being a young continent um, has the capacity to leverage on its youth. And the youth also have um, the power and strength to, you know, influence positive change in their community and also contribute to the advancement of global public health and um, socioeconomic development in their um, various countries. And um, I also believe in the power of collaboration, um, information and idea sharing that would advance, um, you know, um, global public health in our respective um, countries. Um, yeah, some of my references and I just want to acknowledge the One Health and Development Initiative and my mentor um, for providing the support and um, finance for this community project. I also want to um, appreciate some organizations that I'm affiliated with for their advice and also um, Dr. Richards for um, inviting me to share my experience uh, here. And the, uh, I'm also appreciating the um, organizers of these events as well. Uh, so thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm on mute. Can I thank you so much for sharing that. I, I just wondered if you would mind sharing what did you think was the most challenging component of um, getting your project up and running? Well, um, there were various challenges, one of which um, at first I was a little bit clueless about how to get started. You know, I, I didn't just know how to start. I had the idea in mind for it felt like I couldn't really do it or achieve it. And um, the second thing was um, gaining acceptance into the white market. So um, we had issues with um, liaising with the community stakeholders at first because they didn't understand our goals and they thought we were from the government probably to sanction their market based on their you know, behaviors. And um, we, we just had to like explain to them that you no, know, we are here to just um, offer our own service to the community and also try to encourage them to um, get better in their processes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess it, often those um, breaking down those initial barriers is, is one of the, the hardest parts of, I guess, beginning any, any kind of project. And some advice that I, was shared with me um, yesterday from our, our session was uh, um, you need to throw a party. <laughs> if you throw a party, then you get everybody together and more relaxed. And um, I just thought it was an interesting, um, interesting take on that thing of um, how, how do you um, 
yeah how do you break down some of those initial kind of uncertainties and those um embarrassments or all the rest of it that prevent us from um, being able to gain engage uh, in the ways that we might want to um, i'm gonna I, i'd like to not talk now and, um, and offer offer the the opportunity for other people to either share their own experiences or or, or comment um or ask any questions that they'd like to at this point Hello. Hello. So uh, my name is Vasiliki. I am calling from London. Um, I'm actually doing my, my research on education for sustainable development. And I wanted to congratulate you on organizing this session. I, I really wanted to share my experience. I had um, an, an exchange experience during the first year of my, my PhD. And um, I actually, um, it was a program that uh, our university offered for PhD students and it was related to sus uh, the sustainable development goals and sustainable development goal one um, poverty eradication specifically so we we actually a group of us uh, around 20 PhD students um, we visited Japan and a university in Japan specifically and worked with PhD students from that university and other 20 students to develop ideas uh, around uh, how we can solve poverty challenges in, in developing regions. It was, for me, it was one of the most important experiences that I had during the PhD. It actually informed my research and it, it shaped uh, all, all the decisions that I took after, afterwards. And I really, I really appreciated also the cultural exchanges that we had. Uh, because of visiting uh, another country, and I really, I really want to ask how how can you actually substitute for this, you know, place-based experiences that you get uh, from from these kind of kinds of programs uh, when you you have to uh, do them completely remotely, as in COVID situations. Yeah, that's a that's a massive challenge. Um, I wondered if one of the team want to. To respond to that because Stephen um, the this, we've got two Stevens on the project um, St Stephen with a V <laughs> who hasn't spoken yet um, I don't know or Jimena I don't know if you wanted to respond to that what we're around what we're planning to do at least in the interim before we get the opportunity to meet in person um, thank you um, yeah, I think I think that is something that that we have been trying to to tackle in both uh, the knowledge exchange project and also in Set Lab, like Owen mentioned. And I think we are trying uh, to do it, for example, with uh, tablets. So trying to use uh, devices that might help to start the first engagement. Even that has been a massive problem. <laughs> We have spent months trying to send those tablets, but uh, it's sorted now. So I think, uh, you know, the face-to-face -face is the best uh, option. But um, if in the meantime, we can start developing uh, online uh, activities to enable this um, sort of meetup and um, sort of set the context of, for example, sharing videos uh, that will inform as well as uh, have this sort of lens so what i am showing you is something that perhaps for me is important so also like developing this sort of like personal connection with uh, for example the video that you are showing or the space or the picture so somehow have this tacit personal experience knowledge sharing <laughs> through um digital media yeah that's what <laughs> So far, we are we are trying to do, and similarly uh, in in Lab, as as Owen said, to develop this sort of co-creation, um, uh, either either like initiatives or or sort of uh, either like as a device, if we want to call it, uh, we are also trying to engage with different uh, community uh, members to again try to inform or like show us what are the their 
challenges or what they see to be their own challenges through digital media. So instead of us, for example, sending a survey or asking specific questions, perhaps it's, 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 in this case, it's totally the way around. So they are sending us videos, what they sort of important for them and, and sort of setting the context for us. So then we can have this sort of back and forth creativity or creative spaces instead of us just giving, you know, giving one solution or, or them just sending one thing. So it will be a challenge. It will be a new, <laughs> a new way of doing things. But I think we are all learning with this. Uh, like COVID has put us all on the spot to change our way of thinking and, and how we do things. It might not be the best, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, we hope the through serendipity, we might have opportunities to have unexpected um, chances. And I guess the, the, the one advantage of having the extended deadline is that we who are overseeing the project, well, hopefully we'll have more opportunities to get to know each other a little better um, as we move forward. Um, I just noticed that Justin has managed to um, get a connection. Again, I guess this just highlights um, that the, the connectivity is not something that we can take for granted in relation to doing this. So when we do recruit students to the program later in this year, you know, what, what it's getting a good connection is, is one thing, which is why when Jimena says making videos might be a, a good alternative and sharing those and, and exchanging them to and fro in the, in the first, first instances. Justin, are you there? <laughs> We've been talking a lot about you, so it would seem unfair not to give you the opportunity um, to say something about your own role and um, your um, own take on, on the project and the Zlove project as well, if, if you've got uh, enough bandwidth to, to do that. Hi, Mary. Hi, able to get welcome. <laughs> Ah, okay, thanks. You are able to get me now. I think I missed it. Um, you were trying to say something that I have to contribute in one or another. Yeah, I was. I was just saying um, because you, when we did the initial overview, uh, we didn't have an opportunity to hand over to you to talk about your role as the coordinator um, in the resettlement site um, in Mayuqua um, Yuqua, and because uh, uh, we were just framing things in terms of the relationships that we've built up over the last couple of years and the ongoing project of both the ESKI and the ZLab project. So I don't know if you yeah. want to talk a little bit about that because we've also not had, Moine is also having real difficulties with their connection. I keep getting, and so we don't know much about um, either the role of the Department of Resettlement or indeed um, your role. Oh yeah, um, exactly. Um... Currently coordinating the sustainable resettlement program, but um, also the role has been extended to the ESKI project, uh, where I'll basically be coordin uh, coordinating the activities on the ground, basically being the link to the community members, and um, of course the partners that will be implementing uh, all the necessary activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, probably I should be quick to mention that, uh, you know, a sustainable future is driven by innovation and collaboration. And therefore we are starting a journey for a better tomorrow by partnering, uh, you know, with collaborators and probably become more action oriented in solving the challenges that are prevailing uh, here in Mayukwa yeah, of course, there has been one or two partners that have been working, but um, I'm looking forward to participate fully in the SK project and as well as the ZLab project, uh, both of which are underway. Uh, we are currently having, of course, the preliminaries here and there, uh, but I look forward to interact with the community members and also the other partners that have been brought on board. I think that's what I can mention, <laughs> unless there's something else. No, that that's great. That's great. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, so in a, again, are, are there any other questions or anybody else who wants to share their experiences of working, particularly um, with um, students and young people? I mean, I think what Justin says about 
you know, um, working collaboratively um, to address some of these challenges, particularly in the climate in which so much, I know the UK government has taken a very different stance on its previous position in relation to international activity. So it's even more important, if you like, for institutions like Brunel um, and other higher education institutions to um, take up some of that slack in, in terms of using whatever influence or weight they can do to go after. go after funding opportunities. Um, again, still being very mindful, as I said right at the beginning, about um, you know, the complexities and the power relationships that are involved in, when, we, when we're talking about funding. So you know, I'm a white, privileged academic, um, and you know, that positionality um, allows me to um, access things in, in ways that some other people might not be able to, and that's a, a huge injustice in itself. Um, but what we can do is try and um, le leverage that position to try and, you know, level the playing field to, to some extent um, in order to uh, use whatever influence we can do in a way that's going to make a positive difference. Um, and that's why, you know, within the program that we teach, we very much focus on um, they had a lot of the history that students are not taught in UK higher education. Um, so it's, it's first, you know, the legacies of colonialism, the exploitation, the fact that Britain stands on the backs of the lives of millions of others um, as a result of exploitation of resources over, you know, centuries. So um, we're very mindful of, of that and nothing can... Um, make up for that but at the same time we want to bring on the next generation that experiences that urgency to try and do you know to to repair if you like to some extent uh, or at least work towards um uh, creating greater equity uh, in an urgent way um yeah so i think i've probably already spoken too much <laughs> Yeah, um, let me just interject quick. <laughs> yeah, um, my name is Steven. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm also a Global Challenge Research Fellow at Brunel. I'm part of this uh, project team. Um, in, I mean, I'm really, really kind of really interested in the aspect of uh, co-creation of knowledge often facilitated by students themselves. Uh, um, so what our project, I mean, just in addition to what other speakers have already said, uh, our project is really about uh, what we often call Southwest sort of uh, knowledge exchange rather than just any student to embed themselves in the university uh, doing some form of uh, work. Here we sort of have it, the student uh, co-create the knowledge themselves. Um, move a little bit to Vesiliki, uh question about how are we gonna do it uh, in the midst of COVID? Right, this has been quite a challenge uh, for not only for this project, for other projects we're also implementing. Uh, so like one, uh, what Himina said, Although we've really tried very hard to explore different um, channels to see how we can best uh, facilitate this co-creation of knowledge. And one of the way which uh, our team has been looking at is of course, uh, like Imina mentioned is having this, uh, having them recording some form of video, which we can bring them together in a kind of a virtual environment where they can start kind of deliberation and discussions around their, their experiences as well. Uh, but however, it's extremely difficult for us to say that we replace the physical uh, exchange uh, because there is an interesting component of this project, which is uh, community, uh, in the, the link between community uh, practices, as well as uh, what happens actually in the academic uh, classroom se um, sections. And that one is extremely difficult to replace with this uh, COVID uh, thing. But I mean, at this platform, what I would suggest in this platform is to also probably listen to other people who have, might probably have some experience around how to deal with this rather than just we answer questions and probably they might also able to give us a good advice how we can forge ahead. Um, so we are open for that discussions in, in case you have any contributions you want to make regarding this project. <laughs> Chanel, I don't, uh, it's, it's a bit mean to kind of, I just saw Chanel come in and uh, we had a nice conversation the other day and um, I know you've got lots of experience in different sorts of projects. Um, so I, again, as Stephen says, is there any advice that you can <laughs> offer us or um, things that you would like to, to say in relation to some of the projects that you've been involved with? 
<laughs> well, um, thank you so much, Mary, for inviting me. And uh, my apologies uh, for joining in late. I was in another meeting. Um, so I'm just going to share, like, from my experience, because um, I'm really not sure where you guys are at the moment, but I'll try and catch up. Uh, so I'm currently based in, uh, in South Africa at the University of Kozulu Natal, and uh, I've worked on uh, community-based projects, a couple of community-based uh, projects. And right now, I'm just coming from another meeting where we are about to start uh, another one, which is also like a collaboration between us uh, here at the University of Kosovo Natal and uh, a university in Europe. So, but we're still at the very initial stages of the, of the, of the project. So we're still designing um, the questionnaires. It's a multidisciplinary project, but I focus more on the social aspects. So we are still designing our questionnaire and making sure that it captures um, the other aspects of the project as well, because it's uh, it's based on uh, in engineers and the social aspect as well. Uh, so for me, like with my experience in terms of working uh, in communities, like especially for us in South Africa, uh, I mean we work with students as well. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the the ones that like I'm a, I, I've I've just completed my PhD, so even though I was on this project, I was also like a student and 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 working as well. Uh, so, but obviously we have we get like uh, uh, master students, uh, in like uh, yeah, and also PhD students to do the data collection and to to go out there and and. Uh, conduct whether it's collecting the samples that needs to be go to be assessed in the lab or to conduct um, uh, interviews as well. So like it works well, but also we, we've also encountered uh, a couple of challenges. I think some of the things that I've mentioned, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, Mary, earlier on was the issues around safety, mm -hmm. which uh, on this current project, we've decided not to use students because of that okay. and to hire uh, a company because there's companies that that can do that for you, that will actually administer questionnaires and, and stuff like that. So for this particular project, the meeting where I'm coming from, we've decided not to use students. Also COVID has impacted that as well because it's very difficult to find the students. And we don't have a lot of students on campus at the moment, but also looking at the, the, the previous, we had a very challenging uh, experience last time with the students where the issue of safety, you know, <laughs> Here in South Africa, sometimes it can be very tricky and very unpredictable. You, sometimes you find students are out on the ground and there's a shooting happens and you're at the office, you know, it's very, very stressful, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, so we encountered a lot of that shootings. One political party is not happy with the other and they, you know, they, they, they're wondering why, why, do, why do we have these people here because they think the other political party is the one who brought them in and they also want to have votes and so on and so forth. The other issues, members of the community also don't want people from outside coming in because they think they're taking jobs away from them. Even when we explain to them, these are students that we know we need to, they need to meet a minimum <laughs> requirement for them to, to conduct the interview. So we can't just get anyone, but the, sometimes members of the community would be very upset and they want to be included. They want to be the ones to collect the data. They want, you know, they, they want to be the ones to collect the samples and do that. So we've always had um, uh, to work with the community. You know, I think we need a lot of time in terms of uh, community engagement before you start your projects, like you need to be there, you need to be visible in the community, you need to have a relationship with them, you know, so you just don't show up when it's maybe two weeks or before your data collection or when you just start your data collection. Like, because sometimes you can be having ongoing meetings with like the their leaders, but people also in the community need to see you, they need to know who you are because you can have access, like the leaders will be like, no, it's fine, we're happy, you can come through. And you are there thinking you have consent, but then members of the community react differently. So we need that visibility. Uh, and that has to start way before the project starts. You know, we need to give, we need to give people something, t-shirts, t-shirts work a lot, very well. In one of the projects we found that t-shirt worked a lot where you give, you, ha you have, you hold, um, 
community engagement uh, activities where you invite people, you tell them about the project, have, give them uh, t-shirts, have competitions, have drama, invite the schools, let the kids perform. Um, so that those kind of activities, I know we had one project that's going, that's been um, working very well whereby we had, has, I mean, primary schools uh, involved where like they do poetry and they compete among themselves and we like behind that and whoever wins, they get a prize, the school get a prize. Everybody that's there at, uh, attending gets a t-shirt. Um, so even when you come up, you we also will be required to wear those t-shirts as well. So that was bringing a, co a, a connection between us and the researchers uh, and, and the members of the community as well. So I think one thing that works a lot for me, that's one thing I've picked up is community engagement and using different strategies around them, you know, and, you know, and also have to constantly give feedback because sometimes we don't do that. <laughs> we get into the community, we collect our data and we get out, but we have to have at least, a, I don't know, every three months, every six months, go back into the community, give them feedback and make it fun, invite them, do something, have food, you know, and give them something. I think that that uh, allows for, for acceptance, acceptance of, uh, of community-based projects. I think uh, uh, for now, that's all I can say, thank you. Thank you so much, Chanel, that's, I really appreciate that. So that chimes very much with the, the other advice that I was given is, is and Justin, you're like this, is to throw a party, <laughs> to have parties. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, no, thank you. That's that's really helpful, really useful. Is there is there anyone else who would like to um, to share their top tips or their own experiences? Uh, I think um, she brought out something very important. And I think I'd like to say for Zambia, we are going to the pause this year and uh, community-based projects become a challenge if it's an election year. Uh -huh. right. Because when you get into the community, you're not going to have a problem only with the community, but with the government officials. Mm -hmm. They will think now you are working for the opposition. Uh, like currently, I'm like working on the, with the IID and the IUCN on the Protected Area Governance Project. Mm -hmm. And we were on the ground trying to talk to stakeholders and we had a challenge with government officials because this is an election year and we are trying to rush things to ensure that we do it before August. Mm -hmm. So usually when it's an election year, there are all those challenges. I just thought of saying that yeah. aside with, uh, with the Z lab, which we are supposed to do now. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing that challenge being an election year. So the ESCI project will be all right because that's next year. <laughs> But Z Lab have to bear that in mind. Um, yeah, so no, thank you. That's a really good point. I was aware. I, I was aware the elections were happening in August, but I hadn't thought that that would then influence these other things. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, thank you. Is there anything else that people would like to to share? Oh. Yes, um, I would just like to um, talk about what Chan and what um, Chanel had suggested. Um, so I I can recall well, even though we're, we're using some of these strategies, but we didn't know they were that helpful. So I could recall well that, you know, um, while trying to gain entrance into the market during our community-based projects, we, we they, you know, we reached out to this um, positive influencer in the market. So he has, is a, is a, is a, is also a very young person and is well connected with um, the market leaders and also the market um, residents. So I think um, there are these kind of people that can influence the market positively, talk to them on our behalf that, oh, we are coming here for a project and, you know, they can help us control these market people, them, the market traders and the fishmongers. And um, what I also realized was that T-shirt works. So when we entered the market, you know, we, we went with T-shirts and also um, immediately we got to the market. The first person we gave um, our T-shirt was the market leader. And, um, you know, she, she wore the T-shirt and immediately, you know, the, the, um, 
the first reaction, the negative reaction we had gotten um, when when we are about to get started, you know, just um, reduced everything. Um, you know, we, we gain more acceptance. People try to, you know, listen to us and understand our objectives for coming to the market. And, you know, I, I just think these are good strategies and um, to, to use during community-based projects because it was actually very helpful. Yeah. I'll put in an order now. <laughs> T-shirts for everyone. <laughs> No, it's interesting. That's what we we we. I, I was previously involved in a in a, a student focused project, and again, that was what we we took with us then as a kind of um, uh, in Colombia. Uh, it was a was a t shirt, Brunel t shirts, but we could do something that's much more specific to the project. <laughs> um, should be nice. So yeah, thank you. That's another uh, another top tip. Yeah, and as Amanda said, to identify and feel part of something through through t-shirts. That's great. Yeah, I mean, um, with, with the methodological sort of background that I have, which is quite interesting, uh, some of the issues you guys highlighted, I mean, has a lot to do what often we call sense of belonging. I mean, people want to feel, they want to belong to that project. Mm -hmm. right? And one way you guys have really captured that, uh, which and, uh, I think Ayala also mentioned, is idea of giving them t-shirts. Right, so giving them, they putting them on makes them feel that they belong, you know, part of that project. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we often, I mean, we often really don't focus on when we go to communities. We have to really start thinking about how do we make them partners right? rather than researching on them or how do we research together. Mm -hmm. that, that is one of the critical way we have to really start thinking in terms of applying some of these community projects. Um, the other really aspect is also reward. Right, people want immediate reward, right? Um, I mean, I had a channel talking about the idea of probably if you provide food for them, you know, sometimes that works as well, right? That immediate reward also works, right? Okay. But the question I wanted to ask, I mean, we probably, we might also be interested in is the idea of community fatigue. Yeah, what I mean here is that uh, there are a lot of, I mean, people going into community doing projects. So it's reached at a point when people are kind of really fed up mm -hmm. because they said, I'm not seeing any benefit out of all these projects. Yeah, yeah. How do we deal with that? Mm. How you guys? How, how? How you guys? Tell us, please. We are trying to go to Zambia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for for Zambian for Zambian communities, when you from the word go, when you explain to them what the project is all about and what you are expecting to get out of it, you are not going to really have issues. You are going to have issues with them if you don't explain what it is all about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then they will have high expectations, I think. Mm -hmm. But when you actually explain what the project is all about, and for now, because people are really knowledgeable, they've started uh, these communities, you have educated people in there, they do understand. I think what they need is feedback. Mm -hmm. This time they are requesting for feedback. Uh, for example, the area where I'm, I'm working with I, IED, I was doing my PhD there. So when I went back, because initially I told them that I'm going to do vegetation maps for the area, they questioned me to say, we are still waiting for the maps as a community. But I told them, you have to wait until my PhD is out, <laughs> then I'll provide the maps for you. <laughs> so I think feedback is really important for the communities. Yeah. They don't want just to be used to be mm -hmm. people giving people data and information and then they don't see the outcome of it. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's really important at the beginning of the project to make it clear mm -hmm. what you are doing and what you intend to get out of the project. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, can I, I don't know who's, was it Mandek or Melvin? Who's... Go ahead, Melvin. I'll go after. Hi everyone, I'm Melvin Otieno, I'm from Kenya. I pursue masters in environmental health and I've been uh, active in planetary health activities. And I'm also currently leading the planetary health Eastern African hub. So um, now I, I was just happy that uh, I think I'm in the right forum you now that a lot of projects have been ongoing uh, from uh, countries within Eastern Africa that include Zambia and so on. And there is a lot that you guys have been doing. And I think from here, we will, uh, 
work together and be part of uh, the Eastern African hub as well. So uh, concerning uh, community engagement, uh, one thing I, I had uh, an idea of is how can we use creative arts in, a, uh, in, in this kind of scenario? For instance, recently for us here in Kenya, together with the student community from Moi University, we had uh, a campus ambassador who was a, a dance choreographer dance choreographer so we used the, uh, we used that uh, uh, his uh, ideas uh, to strategies on how can we communicate for example the impact of climate change through art and dance so with the collaboration with uh, an artist from germany we strategize a way that we can also engage the indigenous community in this kind of project so we actually visited two indigenous community from kenya that is a maasai community and also the Tugen community so uh, in Maasai, uh, on how we started it, it was that we told them that we came here to learn from them at the same time, to just learn about their cultures. And then in the process, we wanted to discuss this issue of climate change in a way that we can learn from them at the same time, share, promote planetary health. So through that uh, strategy, we went there, uh, danced with them, and then the, the, the modern dancers from Moi University also shared their dancing styles. And in the process after that, we ended up having a tangible conversation with them, and they ended up opening up by telling, them, telling us what their challenges are as far as environmental health issues is concerned. And for instance, for example, the community that we visited um, in Lake Bogoria, where there is lots of flamingos, we find that, that they were so happy to see us at the same time, they opened up that the, the flamingos are, are dying at an alarming, an alarming rate. So we were actually uh, so shocked. This is not really communicated uh, uh, in most cases. So we saw that this was a real situation and they don't have solutions for it because after doing some few interviews with some of them, they said that there is no research work being done and they don't know what could be the causes of this death of the flamingos in that case. At the same time, they're also uh, uh, keeping uh, chickens in their homes and these chickens are also dying. At the same time, these chickens, people feed on it. So they were actually in a situation that they don't know if, they, if whatever is happening to the animals could also impact their own health. So with our visit together with Professor Odipo, who is here, he can also add on if I forget something. Um, we actually uh, raised the awareness at the same time we want now from that to strategize a way that we can go ahead further, communicate uh, this uh, impact to the global community so that we can find a way that we can do research work together with the community. So one thing I actually did was to involve the community leaders in planetary health uh, annual meeting. So two of them have already participated in the annual meeting in the past uh, meeting with the African uh, uh, organizations that we are also closely working with Yola as well, and also Mulopo. So it is it is really uh, amazing to raise voices of this indigenous community as far as environmental health issues is concerned. So I think a, a nice strategy is great at in as much as some, some people can be talented in music and but going to the communities, they are, they are all talented and they can share their culture. So if we go and embrace their culture, afterwards they can open up and share a lot more with us. That's my um, key strategy of how to engage uh, community in this perspective. And I will share with you uh, the YouTube video uh, that we, we, we all uh, participated in and so that you can learn more from us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's Thanks. hugely interesting and helpful as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The point I wanted to make, I think, was a while back. So I'm trying to like connect the dots again. But it was yes. about um, it was about that the the notion of how do how to cultivate because the passion for me is very much about cultivating a sense of. Oh, not just ownership, but a sense that students have a space in creating this transformation. And one thing I'm very keen on is to de, de, not to break down that sort of entrenched notion of academia, of my, my value or my knowledge 
is only worth X, Y, and Z to organizations once I have a degree in my hand. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so the the hope is that the particularly the the homeless uh, the exposure to the homeless community the homeless space in primary care, which is where I do principally a lot of my work on health equity on, is this opportunity to see like this is a space and a forum for for individuals experiences and knowledge but also their framing of these challenges to be to be not just valued but like have that sense of like applicable knowledge to to practice and and one of the benefits that came out of this uh particularly the project week that we had with our students and it blew my mind was that there was one group that had a conversation about why do we keep framing as like homelessness issues and like homelessness com commissioning when a lot of these people do view themselves as having homes. It's the unhoused and how are we going to, how do we change that framing that if, sis, if the system is calling it one thing, but we're viewing it as the other, are we really working towards the same solution? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these sort of opportunities need to be sort of amplified then taken it back into the system. And a lot of the work that I was trying to do of like connecting it with commissioners and, and other organizations and the practices who spoke to us was like, well, these are the outcomes of the the conversations that you've brought in, what you've shared with the students that afternoon that you've had with them, here is what they've been able to produce. And hopefully there's elements of this that are of value to the day-to-day -day work that you do, but I hope that this does change your framing on X, Y, and Z. Because sometimes what we think that individuals take for granted, like, like they must have thought of this because they do this every day, isn't actually it. Mm -hmm. We seem to miss little bits and pieces. And so there's that space of sort of, I disseminating of power really yeah that's such an important point is that sometimes if you are not if you like completely schooled in one particular perspective um you don't you're not um confined by that as an intellectual space and so then um being able to view things through different eyes if you like different lenses can can be quite revealing and unexpected revelations resulting from that. So yeah, encouraging young people, um, whatever their educational background, to think they've got something to offer in all of these, uh, in all of these community spaces, because their their perspective is unique, and they might see something that all of us collectively have missed. So so useful. Um, uh, Odipo, I see you've got your hand up. I'd love to hear from you. Yes, I'm trying to turn on my video. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting, all this. Uh, we, I gained so much from listening. Uh, and uh, I think we should have a lot more of these interactions between us, especially in Africa. We can learn so much from what the, the Nigerians and the Zambians are doing mm -hmm. and what we can be doing. Like Medvin has just said, we learned that we can obtain information very freely when we all do some kind of a dance and festival together with the community. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also heard about the t-shirts, the party. Well, we can learn so much about how to do things in a more interesting way. Mm -hmm. We should be boring. I think we should make our research interesting and make research be a way of life. Uh, yeah, somebody was talking about research fatigue. Yes, it gets very boring if it's monotonous. I think. We, we should try and we should learn from one another how to make research more interesting so that the community members and the researchers can enjoy the whole thing and allow repeat of the same thing. That's all I can say for now. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's so, so true, so true. And again, I think it's, it's, it's um, reconsidering the whole kind of system as it currently operates, as I said right at the beginning, we're often places and positions where if you want to get funding, you have to lay things out in particular sorts of ways and all the rest of it in order to gain access that, to that funding. But actually, what would be much more fruitful would be able to have something that allowed a much more free form, free form framework to operate, um, to allow those um, important conversations to happen earlier in the process and then to come up with what the overall objectives are going to be um, rather than trying to have you know having to be in a position where you're slightly trying to reverse engineer things often um, but again it goes back to the kind of legacy of what constitutes research and how various institutional um, uh, frameworks are set up 
So yeah, let's let's rage against the machine and create other ways of working and other ways of collaborating and, and, and continuing um, these sorts of conversations. Um, so I just, I'm conscious now that we've only got about another five minutes. So I, I wondered if anyone had any ideas about how we might proceed from this point if people are, are interested in continuing these conversations, um, because it'd be great if we could uh, say, create a, a community of practice and network of people that we can um, connect with and have ongoing conversations around these sorts of um, issues and see, see where it might go in, in time. Has anyone got any ideas in relation to that? I mean, I can yeah, set up. I have, okay, I have an idea. Maybe perhaps moving forward, we can strategize a way that we can do benchmarking with, us, with others. For instance, we can identify a the thematic theme as in a thematic area of focus. For example, we can have uh, students to do case studies on, for example, the issue of pollution. So mm -hmm. that maybe we can, uh, due to COVID-19, maybe we can do something like, you say writing, competition kind of thing, mm -hmm. and even come up with a debate forum and then we synergize and see how are people managing pollutions in different countries and then share it out for example yeah. yeah so benchmarking can be very very key yeah no that'd be a nice idea if we had again different sorts of engage engagement activities that we could pull, pull students into yeah um, yeah just uh, yeah yeah but there's something yola is doing and we are supposed to we are about to start the same thing in Kenya about wet markets uh -huh. it, would be, it would be very nice to share experiences we, yeah. we already got some little funds to study how wet market uh, um, uh, influence the COVID or infectious disease transmission. And Iola has just done something similar to that. I think it would be very nice to share. So are, are you all are you all happy to sort of share email addresses and perhaps send us, if I set up a Google, exactly. Google form or something and then we can we can create a WhatsApp group or something that's going to work without too much uh, bandwidth, <laughs> as that's often a, an issue with trying to connect to different places and different times. Yeah. We may also decide to create a group on, on the relaunch Hilo. Um, that's good, yes. Oh, and you're quite right. Sorry, thank you for Maybe Hilo would be a better place. So yeah, 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 yeah. You're right, you're right. Get using it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so we'll certainly we'll set up a high low um, for this particular group. Uh, um, any ideas for names of the group? Um, feel feel free to post them. Um, uh, uh, if anyone's got any inspiration um, that draws upon this emphasis on partying? <laughs> no, um, no. Uh, but this this you know, how do you genuinely engage with communities in ways that are meaningful um, and interesting to them, uh, not just focused on here fill out the survey. <laughs> um, kind of approaches. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I know that some of us were in the PHA Living Labs uh, meeting as well uh, yesterday. Um, that was really interesting. And there is some, some overlap um, maybe with that. So I, um, I don't know how we can do that because they are kind of these kind of communities, across communities um, are kind of living labs um as well in other words are you inviting us to your group <laughs> um i think they may because they had issues with a uh, number of people that were able to join and they were taught by the organizers they may have to run another one um but it was i don't know um i think melvin was here um i don't know if you were here emelda and i didn't recognize your name or if it was someone else uh, but uh, i had <laughs> Yeah, yeah, my yeah. talent is connected with my laptop, so I've connected with my uh, colleague's laptop. And maybe your deeper was so that's why yeah. the name appearing there is not really my name. <laughs> but I, I found the, it was a really interesting session. It was surprising the um, PHA Living Lab session that ah. took place last night um, in a way that I, I didn't expect. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, it's it's just before the, the time we're supposed to stop. So I, I'd just like to um, take the opportunity to thank you so much for um, coming to the session and 
and sharing all your insights um, and your valuable experience. It's been hugely um, useful for us and, and I hope that we'll have an opportunity to um, build something uh, and, and work together um, through a high low. <laughs> um, so does anyone else want anything to say before we the session ends? Because I suspect it's probably going to cut us off. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. This is very informative, taking lots of notes. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. Um, thank you, it's been a great pleasure. Um, and thank you for, for taking the time to join us. Thank you. And speak to you soon, I guess, with all these ideas of how to email list. <laughs> Maintain the momentum <laughs> is the important thing. So yeah, we'll get something set up. Um, <laughs> Oh, this is something I can Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, let's speak more. Um, uh, take care and have a lovely afternoon, evening, morning, depending on where you are in the world at the moment. <laughs> uh, and once again, thank you so much. Good thank one. You. Bye. Bye. Bye now. Bye-bye.